Okay, great. Yeah, so thanks, Raj, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, I certainly want to thank the organizers for this, you know, great opportunity to speak to you today about things we're doing at, at NIST and at the University of Maryland. Um, and this is basically a talk about hardware. So I'll be talking about sort of integrated photonics components we're developing, um, that we're trying to realize certain nonlinear optical functions that we think will be useful, hopefully, for, for future, you know, quantum photonic technologies. Um, and hopefully the way in which we're trying to realize these things will, will is sufficiently general that they may be uh, utilized um, by a variety of different physical systems. Um, so this is an outline for my talk. So I'm going to start by basically trying to, you know, kind of motivate why we're interested in this problem in the first place. I'll spend some time talking about why I think nanophotonics is in particular a compelling platform for realizing, you know, nonlinear optical uh, functions. Uh, and then I'll go through a few selected results from, from our research over the past few years. Uh, so we, you know, we're motivated, like many people here, in, in you know, photonic quantum information science, and, and I think one of the distinguishing you know, sort of features of this field as a whole is that there's just really a broad range of different physical systems that, that people are investigating. You know, and as a result, we need to have access to a very broad range of, of wavelengths. Um, you know, so for example, if you look at this, you know, this chart uh, over the shorter wavelengths near the UV, of course, we already heard about trapped ions. There's also you know, kind of neutral atoms. These things power clocks, for example. Uh, going to somewhat longer wavelengths, but still in the visible, we have, you know, different color centers in diamond, uh, different single molecule systems, you know, now going into the short near infrared, we have epitaxial quantum dots and alkali atoms and, you know, other color centers in silicon carbide. Uh, and of course, in the telecom band around 1.55, you know, microns, that's where you have your lowest propagation losses for light going through optical fibers. Uh, so nonlinear optics is, you know, a very natural way that we can think about connecting these different wavelengths together. And, and we tend to think about this in, in a few different contexts. You know, so one of the things that we're interested in is basically being able to use nonlinear optics in order to be able to generate you know, the coherent light that we need to drive these quantum systems. And, and in some cases, this will be at multiple wavelengths. So if you think about atomic clocks, many times you need several different wavelengths in order to you know, prepare and read out the system. And, and the same can be true for, for different types of quantum sensors. You know, maybe you need something for state preparation and something for readout, maybe something for manipulation or, or repumping and so on. Uh, we're also interested in, in, you know, scenarios in which we can really, you know, physically link different, you know, quantum technologies together in a network. You know, so here we want to have access to, to so-called quantum frequency conversion, basically being able to manipulate uh, the color of quantum states of light, ideally being able to manipulate, you know, the bandwidth or really the temporal profile of quantum states of light. Uh, and then we're also interested in, in, you know, trying to develop different types of, you know, sort of precision metrological tools that we can use to interrogate, you know, our quantum systems. So, so these are things like optical frequency combs, which, you know, in addition to performing precision metrology, they're used for things like, like synchronization and time transfer, which you might need, you know, for example, in networks. Uh, so the platform which we want to realize these different nonlinear optical functions is based upon kind of integrated nanophotonics technology. So, so for me, what this means is basically we take advantage of a fabrication technology that allows you to, to pattern the dielectric function of materials at, at very small length scales. Uh, and being, by being able to do that, you can really control, you know, the propagation and confinement of light uh, essentially at the wavelength scale. Um, at the same time, you know, we're taking advantage of this kind of, you know, hopefully scalable nanofabrication technology that people have been developing for many years for, for many different applications, you know, ideally giving you access to kind of repeatable and fine control of geometries uh, and being able to really, you know, integrate different functional elements together, hopefully into some kind of complex physical systems. Uh, so, you know, these are some examples that people have, you know, looked at in terms of integration of kind of nonlinear functionality with other, with other elements. And so, you know, the ideal goal would be that we don't just have a nonlinear optical chip that we have to service using, you know, all tabletop optics and so on. Ideally, we'd like to be able to, to build everything together. Um, so this is some nice work coming out of MIT. There's been, you know, obviously things coming out of Bristol and other places as well, where they combined, um, you know, nonlinear light generation, in this case, spontaneous Fourier mixing and silicon resonators. Uh, together with some, you know, kind of passive linear functionality like splitters and filters and, and interferometers. Now, over the past several years, there's really been a lot of interest in being able to combine uh, pump laser technology with nonlinear photonics. Um, this is both kind of doing this heterogeneously, so really trying to integrate gain media together with nonlinear optical media in a common kind of platform. This is also sometimes done through so-called hybrid integration, so this is really looking at you know, chip to chip coupling. So taking a compact laser chip and directly coupling it to, to a nonlinear optical chip. You know, and so the goal of all this type of component integration is to really eventually be able to create some type of, you know, fully integrated system that, that ideally is deployable and somehow has, you know, this nonlinear optical technology at its core. Um, so there's a couple of examples of projects that we've been involved with. They've kind of been big team projects. 
in, in trying to basically develop some of these technologies to make them deployable. Uh, and so one of those things is, is an optical frequency synthesizer. The other is an optical atomic clock. These aren't really, I would say, explicitly quantum technologies, but, but maybe they're sort of quantum adjacent. Uh, so how the, what the synthesizer is supposed to do is basically it's supposed to be uh, a chip integrated laser that produces light in the telecom band. Uh, and you can choose the output frequency with Hertz level accuracy and precision. So something like a part in 10 to the 14. Uh, on the other hand, you know, what the clock does, it kind of works in the opposite direction. So, so you take a laser, that's your oscillator, and you stabilize it to an atomic reference, so some optical transition that's environmentally insensitive inside you know, an atomic medium. And now you have this stabilized oscillator, and it's oscillating at, at hundreds of terahertz, and you divide it down to a microwave frequency, and that's the output of your clock. Uh, and so the reason why both of these things can work in principle with any kind of metrological you know, precision is because they have fully stabilized frequency combs inside them, and those frequency combs are based upon this, this kind of chip integrated nonlinear optics. Um, these are cartoons, you know, showing kind of aspirational goals in terms of where we would like this stuff to go. Uh, you know, in reality, these, these papers here basically describe how these integrated photonics components can actually, you know, satisfy what one needs, but, but none of this stuff was really fully integrated. These were kind of separate chips that were strung together in labs by, by optical fibers and so on. But, but that's kind of the motivation. Okay, so, you know, there's a lot, you know, apart from kind of like this device level integration and building, you know, uh, nonlinear photonic systems that, that, you know, there's a lot aside from that that we're interested in, in taking advantage of this kind of nanophotonics platform. You know, so when we think about these, you know, parametric nonlinear optical processes, the types of things that we need to be able to, to realize, you know, we need materials that are optically transparent across a very broad wavelength range if we're going to be working with, with very different wavelengths. Uh, we want to have a large effective nonlinearity associated, you know, both with the material as well as the modal confinement. Uh, we want to have access to high optical intensities. That's what really lets you get, you know, access to the nonlinear response of a medium. Uh, and then typically we have to worry about, you know, phase and frequency matching or equivalently, you know, momentum conservation and, and energy conservation. You know, so in nonlinear optics, typically this phase matching is something you have to kind of worry about because, you know, materials have dispersion, right? So light is propagating at, at different speeds as a function of wavelength. And so this momentum conservation or phase matching isn't, isn't trivially achieved. You know, of course, this is well known, right? The reason why the a prism, you know, disperses your different colors out spatially is because th there's this dispersive property, basically. Um, and there's lots of ways that you can overcome this dispersion. So in kind of classic nonlinear optics, you take advantage of things like birefringence of media, um, you know, quasi-phase matching or pulling of, of, you know, certain media like KTP and lithium niobate is, is you know, ubiqu ubiquitously used. Here you basically have you know, a grading in your nonlinearity and that compensates for your wave vector mismatch. Uh, and then also, you know, in optical fibers in particular, people have taken advantage of, of optical waveguiding effects. And so here you can basically think of this as kind of the fraction of your optical field that resides within your core uh, of your waveguide relative to your cladding of your waveguide uh, has a strong variation as a function of wavelength. And so this basically impacts the propagation constant of light going through that fiber, and that, that gives you kind of a mechanism uh, by which you can compensate for, for wave vector mismatch and get phase matching. You know, so with nanophotonics, you know, at least our, our style of nanophotonics, we're really taking advantage of this ladder effect, uh, ladder effect basically. So taking advantage of, of waveguiding dispersion uh, as a way to achieve phase matching. Um, but it's really pronounced in these nanophotonic geometries because your light is so tightly confined. Um, and so, you know, this basically, you know, results in sort of a scenario where the, the geometry of your device is what, is what really dictates your nonlinear optical interactions. Uh, so I'm going to come back to this example a little bit later in more detail, but I think it's kind of a good illustration. Uh, so what we're doing here, these are three, you know, very similar micro ring resonators, and we're pumping them with the same near infrared pump laser. And the light that we're generating through this process, which is called optical parametric oscillation, the specific output color we're generating varies from green to yellow to orange, simply based upon, you know, the specifics of this ring resonator. So essentially the resonator cross section. You know, and this ultimately comes about because you have this very strong waveguiding dispersion effect in, in these systems. Uh, so what I'm plotting here is something called the effective index, which is related to the propagation constant of light going through one of these waveguides. And this propagation constant is highly dispersive as a function of, you know, of wavelength uh, on this top x-axis or, or frequency on this bottom x-axis, as well as a function of geometry. So, so these different geometries are just varying by a few tens of nanometers, but this effective index is very strongly varying. Uh, and so this really, you know, gives us a sort of knob that we can utilize to compensate for the intrinsic material dispersion uh, associated with, with the films that we use. 
Okay, so we typically don't just work in waveguides, we typically work in, in microresonators. So for example, take one of these waveguides and just wrap it around into a ring. Uh, and the basic reason for doing so is we want to take advantage of, of resonant enhancement. So we want to take advantage of the ability to realize high cavity quality factors. And, and together with the strong field confinement, you can get very large circulating intensities in these resonators. So, so your circulating intensities can be on the order of something like a gigawatt per square centimeter, even for a continuous wave uh, input fields that are on the order of a few milliwatts. And, and so this is kind of you know, consistent with this vision that we can use these compact chip integrated lasers. And by taking advantage of this strong resonant enhancement, we can really access the nonlinear response uh, of the materials we're working with. And so there's a lot of different resonators that, that one can think about. There's these kind of one-dimensional and two-dimensional photonic crystals, these grating cavities, different types of whispering gallery cavities. Um, and in general, we're kind of agnostic a priori as to what kind of cavity we use. But, but we do care about you know, these kind of key considerations here on the bottom. So, so one thing is that if we're going to be doing frequency mixing, frequency conversion, and so on, we need high cavity quality factors at all these different wavelengths that can be widely separated. This is just to give us res resonant enhancement everywhere. Um, and then the other thing we care about is, is we need a certain sweet spot in terms of fabrication control and sensitivity, right? So we want to be sensitive enough that these changes in geometry are going to give us you know, changes in what colors we generate, what colors we address. That's kind of the power of this approach. But, but we don't want it to be so sensitive that you know, unavoidable fabrication errors are going to lead to you know, uh, uh, sort of imperfect or, or sort of you know, fluctuating uh, results, essentially. Uh, and so what this typically means for us is we use these, these ring resonators, which, which I kind of mentioned earlier. This is just a really common sort of geometry that's used in integrated photonics. Um, and the specific material platform we work with is, is silicon nitride, which you maybe heard a little bit about earlier. Um, it's grown on silicon dioxide, all on silicon. And, and the main reason why we use this material is that it's just, it's pretty well understood. So there's a lot of different groups that use it. It's available in, in commercial foundries. And things like the refractive index dispersion over wavelength are, are pretty well understood and characterized. Um, the other thing is that this is a material where it's kind of known that you can achieve pretty good losses across a broad range of wavelengths. Uh, it has a relatively large optical nonlinearity. It's, it's a third order optical nonlinearity. Um, it's about 10 times that of glass. And then if you take into account modal confinement, you have a pretty strong nonlinearity relative to what you would have for an optical fiber, for example. Okay, so over the last few years, we've been looking at a few different kind of third order nonlinear processes in these resonators, and I'm kind of outlining some of them here. Uh, so the top left, this is this process I mentioned earlier called Kerr frequency comb generation. So the basic idea here is that you come in with a single frequency laser as your input, and you have this kind of cascaded nonlinear interaction inside the ring that uh, you know, results in a comb of equally spaced parametric sidebands. Uh, the process on the top right here is, is optical parametric oscillation. So I, I alluded to this earlier. This is what we're trying to utilize in order to create different laser colors across the visible, essentially, with, with a common pump laser. Uh, the process underneath it is, is very similar. This is basically a working subthreshold where you can create entangled photons that can be highly non-degenerate. Uh, this process here is, is optical harmonic generation, something like third harmonic generation, where you know, metrologically, this is quite useful because you have a very precise frequency relationship between your input and output frequencies. Uh, and then the final process that we've been looking at is, is this quantum frequency conversion. Here we're interested in things like taking a, a red photon and making it a blue photon uh, through the application of pump fields and taking advantage of some parametric nonlinear process. Okay, so I don't have time to talk about all these things, but I'm going to focus in on, on these three here. Uh, but I do want to spend a little bit more time talking about this phase and frequency matching just because it's kind of an important concept for why any of this stuff works. Um, so I'm going to take a, a simple example. This is going to be that of, of spontaneous Fourier mixing. Uh, so here I'm going to have two centrally located uh, pump photons. Uh, in this case, I'll take a frequency of 250 terahertz. And we're going to try and create photons at 300 terahertz. So it's going to be an upshifted signal. And then the partner idler is going to be at two, 200 terahertz. It's going to be a downshifted idler. Uh, and so you're going to be satisfying this frequency matching condition. And then simultaneously, we need to satisfy this, this momentum conservation or phase matching condition. Right? And so the way that we do it with these geometries, is, as I kind of mentioned earlier, is that we utilize you know, a specific waveguide cross-section that gives us the dispersion relationship that's going to simultaneously satisfy this frequency matching and this phase matching. But then what we're actually doing, we're not doing it in waveguides. We're doing it in resonators to take advantage of the resonant enhancement. 
Uh, with these ring resonators, there's a particularly, you know, kind of simple form associated with the phase matching because you basically have this kind of periodic boundary condition where the field needs to come back on itself after, after 2 pi. Uh, and so essentially what you're doing is you're basically discretizing uh, this dispersion relationship. Uh, and so ultimately you have modes, and if the modes are, are, you know, these are discrete modes, if they are, you know, phase matched, as long as they're simultaneously frequency matched, we can get things to work. And, you know, this isn't going to happen for any arbitrary ring resonator, but again, what you basically work on is you work on engineering the cross section of this ring uh, in order to be able to simultaneously satisfy the phase and frequency matching. For very, very large rings, there's little effect of the bending. It's very similar to a waveguide. For much smaller rings, you do really have to take into account the thing is bending and is not exactly the same as a straight waveguide. Okay, so now I'm going to spend a bit of time kind of going through some of the different things that, that we've been working on over the last few years in a little bit more kind of specific detail. Um, and I'll start with these um, kind of highly non-degenerate visible telecom entangled photon pair sources. And so this is work that uh, my colleague Xu and Lu did when he first joined my group several years ago. Uh, and the basic idea is, is the spontaneous Fourier mixing process I mentioned. So we have a centrally located pump that co contributes two photons that get annihilated in order to create a downshifted idler and an upshifted signal. You know, in practice, this is kind of what it looks like. So here we've pumped at a wavelength at about 930 nanometers. We have the signal at about 660 nanometers, and the idler is at about 1550 nanometers. Uh, and so ultimately, you know, if we go through and measure the modal frequencies for this system, we find that the level of frequency mismatch is something like 160 megahertz, even though these modes are separated by a couple hundred terahertz. And, and so that's kind of the name of the game with this type of work is, is really having an accurate understanding of your material dispersion and how your waveguiding effects basically impact that dispersion. Uh, and if you're able to do that with enough fabrication control, then, then you can get these widely separated modes to, to be matched. You know, now these photons that are being generated, you know, if they're really being generated as a pairs, what that means is that every time you produce a signal photon, you also produce an idler photon. And so we can do, you know, very simple sort of correlation measurements, trying to look at, you know, how often we are producing pairs of photons at a time. And there's this kind of metric that people sometimes use called a coincidence to accidentals ratio. And basically we see that it's relatively high at low pump powers, a couple thousand to one, um, because here we're mostly generating one pair at a time. As we pump it harder and harder, this, this coincidence to accidentals ratio goes down because we start to generate multiple pairs. Uh, and then ultimately you can do something like compare this type of chip integrated technology with like a tabletop equivalent. Um, so these photons that we're producing are, they're in a cavity, so they're somewhat narrow line width. And so the types of things you wanna, you wanna compare this to are things like um, SPDC within a, a macroscopic cavity, for example. And, and I would say ultimately, if you look at kind of these two metrics of this coincidence to accidentals ratio plotted against pair flux, we're kind of similar to some of the what people have done in the tabletop systems. And I think there's ways to improve things, but right now I would say it's, it's somewhat similar. Another the things I'll kind of mention are, so you can actually show that these photons are not just uh, correlated, they can actually be entangled in a time energy basis. You know, the reason why this is kind of interesting is that one of these photons is at a visible wavelength and the other is at a telecom wavelength. And so you can think about ways you could use this, right? You could, for example, the telecom photon could go across a fiber network, maybe the visible photon is going across some free space network. You can also think about using this type of uh, pair source to help promote kind of remote entanglement of, of distant local quantum systems. So imagine you have some color center spins that are entangled with visible wavelength photons. You know, those visible photons are not going to propagate along long distances across a fiber. Um, so instead, maybe those visible photon, you know, those, sorry, those color center spins can become entangled with your telecom photons from one of these sources through an entanglement swapping operation. And then, of course, you can entanglement swap again. And so you can ultimately end up with, with remote spins that are entangled. So that's kind of the motivation for this. You know, from a technology perspective, the thing I like about this and why I'm saying we believe that this is kind of a general approach is that there is nothing particularly special about the 660 nanometer wavelength and the 1550 nanometer wavelength. Uh, and so what we're showing here, this is data from a series of devices where we varied this geometric cross section and we also varied the pump wavelength over kind of a more limited range, for basically where this one tunable laser could operate. And what we found is that the signal photons that we generate go anywhere from as short as around 630 nanometers up to as high as about 820, 830 nanometers. In this case, because we restricted our pump wavelength range, you know, the partner idler photons due to energy conservation go from as short as around 1050 nanometers out to about 1850 nanometers. And so there's just a lot of ability to engineer, you know, what specific wavelengths you, you generate just by changing the geometry, not necessarily even changing your pump source. And, and ultimately what you would like to be able to do, you know, we kind of hope is that,
these sorts of things are available in some kind of foundry and you basically just tell them what designs you want for, for certain wavelengths essentially. Okay, so the next thing I'll mention are these optical parametric oscillators. Uh, and this is again, you know, the goal here is to be able to generate coherent visible light. Uh, and so, you know, to go into this motivation a little bit more, right, again, there's all these important physical systems that we care about in the visible, uh, maybe at the, you know, short, near infrared. And, and typically in our labs, the way that we address these types of systems are using things like titanium uh, sapphire lasers or maybe external, capital, uh, external cavity uh, tunable diode lasers. And, and, you know, these are really wonderful workhorse laboratory tools. They, they're really, really nice. But they're kind of big and they're sometimes expensive and they're not necessarily amenable to, to kind of deploying outside of a lab. Uh, but in another context, you know, there's really been a lot of work done on chip integrated lasers, particularly like in the telecom. So now there are these heterogeneously integrated lasers at 1550 nanometers. They can produce tens of milliwatts of output power. They can have sub kilohertz line widths. People even demonstrated, you know, sub hertz line widths now. And so what we're quite interested in, in trying to understand is, you know, instead of having to make or remake these types of lasers, using different gain media at all these different wavelengths, you know, can we take advantage of this flexible nonlinear nanophotonics to basically take a good compact integrated laser and then translate its wavelength to, to some wavelength of, of interest. You know, so the basic idea is to use this optical parametric oscillation process. So again, come in with a single frequency pump and through the geometry of this ring resonator, we can produce, you know, whatever signal wavelength we care about, or, or maybe in some cases we care about the idler wavelength. You know, so what you can imagine as well, those entangled photon pair sources, they're already in a cavity. So what happens if you just pump it harder? Because eventually maybe you'll get some parametric gain that overcomes loss and you create an optical parametric oscillator. And, and indeed we do get an OPO. Unfortunately, it's not the parametric oscillator we want. Uh, and the basic reason for this, so what you can see in this, in this graph is that we produce all these parametric sidebands around the pump instead of the parametric sidebands that we really care about that are widely separated from the pump. You know, the basic reason for this is that we have nonlinear frequency shifts in this material. So this is a Kerr nonlinear medium. So there's an intensity dependent refractive index. And what's basically happening is that when we're pumping this system hard enough, so we don't really worry about this with the photon pairs because we're working at, at weak excitation. But when we pump it hard enough, we introduce these Kerr frequency shifts and it takes modes that were near the pump that were initially mismatched and it makes them match. Uh, and if they match, you know, kind of more strongly or, or more easily than the modes that are widely separated, then we're going to get oscillation on, on these you know, unwanted modes instead. Uh, and so this is just a constraint for us. And in general, with these forward mixing devices, we have to always worry about this. It's not just about promoting the process of interest. It's also about inhibiting all the other possible processes that are in the system. Uh, and so what we ended up doing, what Xuan did, is basically introduce an additional constraint where we say that uh, we need the device to have normal dispersion near the pump. And, and what this effectively means for us is that these curve frequency shifts are going to be in the wrong direction. So it's going to take these modes and it's going to, that are close to the pump and it's going to make them more mismatched instead of closer to being matched. Uh, and when we do that, we see you know, this kind of thresholding behavior and we see this kind of clean output spectrum uh, associated with an OPO. So, so the next thing that we want to be able to do is to really show that we can create these different colors of interest. Uh, and so what I'm showing here, these are different basically simulations where, where the take home here is to look at where the zero crossings are. And so these zero crossings determine where the output colors are going to be. And this is associated with just the, the geometric control of the dispersion of the resonator. Uh, and so then we do the same thing in the experiment. This is the data I already showed you where we you know, get the output color to go from green to yellow to orange to red. Uh, and then we can do this for many different devices uh, you know, across a chip, across a couple of chips with slightly uh, different pump wavelengths if needed. And what we're able to do in aggregate is sort of cover a relatively large spectral range going from about 1200 nanometers in the infrared out to about 560 nanometers in the visible. And so this isn't all one device, right? These are all different devices. For a given device, you have a certain amount of continuous tuning that can be on the order of a couple hundred gigahertz. And then you have a certain amount of tuning associated with pumping different cavity resonances. But then on a single chip, you can have many different devices associated with the different geometries. You know, so this is just a compilation of some of these spectra, just showing that we're reaching some of the different wavelengths of interest that I mentioned earlier. You know, wavelengths associated with indium arsenide quantum dots, some of the different color centers in diamond, um, some rare earth doped crystals, some of the different alkali atom uh, transitions. But, but if you look at any one of these spectra, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of power in the signal or the idler. And, and in general, you know, when we measured how much power we had, it was maybe something like a microwatt on chip. And, and so, you know, that's obviously quite limiting. 
Um, but we didn't think there was really anything fundamental in terms of what was limiting it, at least at the level of getting to kind of milliwatts of power. Uh, and so for the past couple of years, my, my postdoc Jordan Stone has worked with Xi Wen uh, to really show this in practice. <clears throat> and so what I'm showing here, these are some new results that are on the archive. So this is a spectrum that's actually a compilation of, of many different OPO devices. So something like 16 or 18 different microresonator OPOs, where we're just varying the geometry again to control the output color. And then we've improved the resonator waveguide coupling in order to really access as much light as possible into the waveguides. And what we're able to show is that we can get, you know, kind of more than a milliwatt across this big spectral range from about 590 nanometers to 1150 nanometers. Uh, in some cases, it goes up to about five milliwatts or so. Uh, and the conversion efficiency from pump to any one of these, you know, single sidebands is as high as about 15%. Uh, and so now we're at kind of this few milliwatt level. We have some other data on, on kind of near infrared OPOs at, at longer wavelengths where we've pushed this up to something like 20 milliwatts or so. Um, things tend to be a little bit more difficult in the visible, but, but I think it's still doable. And, and I can answer questions on that if, if there are any. Okay, so then the final thing I want to talk about before, before wrapping up, I think I'm doing fine on time, uh, is this topic of, of quantum frequency conversion. You know, so there's a lot of different scenarios in which people are interested in this quantum frequency conversion. You know, one of the most common things is that you have your different physical systems that you really like. You would like to network them together, maybe over fiber because it's convenient. If you want to do it over fiber, you would like to do it, you know, in 1550 nanometers. You know, and this is just kind of exemplified by, by what's shown here on the right. This is the kind of the 3 dB propagation length. So when you lose half your light at different wavelengths, and so at 1550 nanometers and in standard fiber, it takes about 15 kilometers before you lose half your light. If you go down to the 900 nanometer band where you have some of the indium arsenide quantum dots, this is reduced by about a factor of 10. You go down to the red, this is reduced by another factor of five or so. So ideally you would like to have this you know, efficient and low noise down conversion to the telecom and then up conversion back to your original wavelength. And then there's other scenarios in which you might want to use this. So people have talked about trying to make you know, sort of heterogeneous quantum networks so not have all the matter-based nodes be the exact same physical system. And there's reasons why you might want to do this. Maybe there's one system that's good at doing processing and there's another one that's good at storage, you know, for a memory. Um, and, and having this frequency conversion is, is important. You know, this is kind of a harder problem overall because you also have to worry about the bandwidth mismatch associated with your different types of, of systems, basically. Uh, so there's other types of scenarios in which people have used this frequency conversion. You know, so there's been experiments where you try and overcome spectral distinguishability. So, Systems like indium arsenide quantum dots typically don't produce photons at exactly the same wavelength due to some size dispersion or other things that are characteristic for how they're made. Uh, and so you can think about frequency converting to the exact same, same wavelength, for example. Um, this is not as important anymore, but, but previously, I, I would say kind of prior to the advent of SNSPDs, you know, there was this challenge associated with detection at telecom wavelengths. And so converting to, to wavelengths where you have really good detectors was important. Uh, and then the hardware, you know, for most of this stuff, as I kind of mentioned earlier, has typically been, you know, these kind of centime centimeter scale quasi phase match, you know, nonlinear waveguides. Uh, and so our motivation is the same as was the case for the entangled photon pair sources or these optical parametric oscillators. We want to use this kind of silicon photonics based platform to create these frequency converters that are useful for quantum states of light, you know, and hopefully it's relatively general in terms of being able to, to re engineer them to work with different systems. Uh, so this is work that that uh, former postdoc Ching Lee did. He's he's now faculty at Carnegie Mellon, uh, and so the specific uh, process that we utilize, you know, to take advantage of the chi three nonlinearity is called uh, Fourier mixing Bragg scattering, or, or previously it was called wavelength exchange. Uh, and the basic idea is that you take your input signal and you shift it by an amount equal to the difference in two pump frequencies. So with summer difference frequency generation in a chi two, you just have the energy of your pump that sets the difference between your input and your output frequencies. With Bragg scattering, you actually have two pumps, and so you get a little bit more flexibility. It's now the difference in the two pump frequencies that matters, but, but it's also, you know, in some cases, a little bit more challenging because you have these two pump lasers you have to worry about. Uh, and so, you know, you can have frequency down conversion in this case. You can also have frequency up conversion. Whether you see either or both of these processes just is just determined by how well phase and frequency matched, you know, these different modes are, these different fields are. Uh, and so what Cheng was able to demonstrate, you know, for example, was down conversion from the 900 nanometer band to the 1550 nanometer band. Um, this data probably doesn't mean too much unless I walk you through it, but, but the upshot was that the conversion efficiency was something like 60%. And, and what was really limiting that conversion efficiency was just the resonator waveguide coupling. So the conversion efficiency inside the ring was something like 90%. And then the gap between 90% and 100% has to do with these, 
additional sort of unwanted parametric sidebands that are suppressed by 10 dB in some cases, but, but if you really want to get to 100%, you have to account for them. Uh, we also looked at noise with this system. I would say it's still kind of a work in progress. We have identified that there are certain noise sources in the silicon nitride that we have to worry about that we know how to deal with, things like spontaneous Fourier mixing associated with these pumps. There are certain other noise processes that we're still trying to understand, things like fluorescence that can come about from nanocrystals that are actually grown when you when you deposit these films. Okay, so the other thing that we did with Ching was we were able to look at this other uh, frequency conversion process where we have our two pumps in the 1550 nanometer band. So they're just separated by a few terahertz. And so this is just going to lead to a few terahertz upshift or downshift. But, but the important thing is that these pumps are really widely separated from your signal and idler. And so they don't really contribute any, any noise. And, and the noise I'm referring to here is just additive photon noise, basically. You know, spurious photons into either your input signal channel or your output idler channel. Uh, and so what we were able to show here is that we get a conversion efficiency of about 30% into either the upshifted channel or the downshifted channel. We actually get both simultaneously because both are phase and frequency match in this case. It, it is possible to suppress it. Uh, and then we're able to show that the noise is actually far reduced in this system. Um, so to look at this a little bit more carefully, we did a kind of a demo experiment. So we have a, a quantum dot single photon source. We heard about these a little bit earlier in the conference. And that was basically sitting here to the left. It outcoupled its photons into an optical fiber. And then we sent it into our frequency converter and just looked at photon statistics before and after frequency conversion. Um, and so that's shown down here. And, and the upshot is that this anti-bunch signal kind of remains anti-bunch after frequency conversion. There is clearly some degradation in the photon statistics, and that has to do with some of the residual noise in, in these devices. Uh, I'll also mention that we did a little bit looking at preservation of quantum coherence, so basically interfering photons that were initially non-degenerate, uh, so taking the frequency converter, making those photons degenerate, and then looking at quantum interference. This just says that we preserve coherence to kind of within the line width of our photons, which in this case, our photons are a few hundred megahertz wide, so it would be quite interesting to look at this sort of thing in the context of like a trapped ion or something that would produce much, much narrower photons. Then you might have like frequency noise you have to worry about associated with things like the thermorefractive noise in, in these devices. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of skip through this a little bit because I'm kind of running out of time. I'll just say that, you know, we are quite interested in, in large spectral gaps as well. Uh, you know, I would say right now we have a good idea how to do things with spectral gaps that are on the order of 100 terahertz, 150 terahertz. But if you want to go from like a color center and diamond to the telecom, so like a 300 terahertz gap, or even more challengingly, you know, a trapped ion to the telecom, that's very difficult. And it's even difficult to do with Chi 2 in, in a way to get, you know, kind of low noise. Uh, and so in this paper, we put forth one proposal for doing this using a, a third order summer difference frequency generation process. Um, the basic thing here is that in regular sum and difference frequency generation, there's one pump photon that makes up the difference between your input and output frequencies. In this third order process, it's, it's two pump photons, and this allows your pump to be at a really long wavelength. And hopefully this kind of limits some of the, the noise processes associated with, with uh, you know, these types of devices, things like Raman scattering, for example. Okay, so I'm kind of running out of time. I'll just, you know, in the end, kind of mention that, you know, we are also looking at kind of new technologies associated with these things. So not just working with ring resonators, but also in incorporating photonic crystal patternings that gives us a lot more control over the electromagnetic field. Uh, you can do things like eject your light into orbital angular momentum states if you care about that. You can do some really interesting dispersion engineering associated with targeting very specific resonances of these rings. Um, these are some things related to integration, uh, and you can actually heterogeneously integrate your sources. I didn't really have time to talk about that. And so I'll just stop by, you know, thanking all the people that have been involved. I mentioned most of them by name during the talk. Uh, also our funding support from NIST and from DARPA. One final plug, so I, a few months ago I agreed to be an associate editor for Physical Review Applied. A lot of the things that people talk about at this conference, you know, might be relevant for Physical Review Applied, so, so please consider it when you're submitting papers. Um, so with that, I can, I can take any questions. Thanks. Thank you.